been here ever since. Since, since what, 2011, you said? 13. 2013, okay, so it's been a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and he's going to tell us about carrier screening and KMERS. So it sounds very interesting. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. So um, indeed, my talk is going to be fairly disjointed today. There are two almost completely, no, actually completely unrelated topics. Uh, the first topic is about carrier screening. And really the idea here is that you want to determine carrier status for very specifically chosen alleles. This is all about assessing reproductive health risk. Um, we're doing this in a clinical sequencing context in a CLIA CAP accredited lab. And um, this part of the talk is going to be very applied. And it's going to be focusing on very concrete problems. And the solutions are going to be somewhat unsatisfying because they're going to be very practical and ad hoc. And really the focus here is on product development and making a really nice high functioning assay. And so um, really it's like, you know, hacking through brush in a jungle. You just have to get through, you know, whatever plant you're going through so you can get on down the path. You really want to solve things quickly. So if you have any solution at all, you're happy and you move forward. And then I'm going to uh, take a hard turn and we're going to talk about all versus all camera comparison. And so carrier screening is really satisfying work because this is really all about helping people. Uh, not so much with the next part of my talk. This is just going to be a very abstract, hardcore algorithm. And here the idea is that I'm going to describe a data structure that I've derived by combining ideas from coding theory. And in particular, I've got this, uh, well, someone else came up with it, but I've been using a perfect Hamming code on DNA fibers. And it turns out that um, if you combine that with a classical string algorithm called a sequence try, you can actually get some real efficiency for a specific problem. Uh, that problem is finding all pairs of cameras that match within a very small Hamming distance. Uh, the thing about this approach is that um, it's very specific. So it only really works for uh, specific values of k in particular, k has to be a multiple of five, and that's because of the structure of um, the perfect handling code. So starting with carrier screening, uh, I just want to have a, you know, I work in a corporate environment, so I just want to describe my company a little bit. Uh, we're a company that does clinical sequencing. We're focused on women's health. We're actually fairly young, so we were founded in 2011, and we're located just down the street on South State Road, just south of the airport. Uh, we're a CLIA CAP accredited lab, so we can do clinical sequencing. And we have, you know, a, what's, what we describe as a, a menu. This, these are the tests that you can order from us. Among those are a test for uh, cystic fibrosis carrier uh, status. Um, we have a panel that tests for mutations enriched in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. And then we have a test that's not really carrier screening, but this is really intended to help psychiatrists with dosing for um, specific medications. And uh, since this is a bioinformatics talk, I just want to say that we have a bioinformatics group. We have there's six of us, including me. Two of them are from the University of Michigan. And mostly what we do is spend time uh, supporting research and development and doing a lot of product development. So um, most of the time when people think about clinical sequencing, they're thinking about this sort of diagnostic odyssey. And this is really different than what we're doing. So, a diagnostic odyssey is really just a general test of different for differences from the reference in a sample. And really what happens here is that a patient will come in, they'll have some specifics that, some specific symptoms that indicate that some genetic testing might be helpful. And then they will sequence <laughs> the patient's genome. Uh, this might be a whole genome sequence, it might be an exome, or depending on the um, position and the indications, it might be a panel. And then you'll um, analyze data to find variants. There will be a lot of them especially if you're doing an exome or a whole genome, you'll find a lot of variants. Many of them will be very suspicious. Uh, they'll seem like they might be pathogenic. Most of them you'll have no idea whether or not they're related to the disease state. But occasionally, I think about 25% of the time at the moment, especially if you can do a trio, so the, pa the, the patient and the parents, uh, you'll find a variant that's likely to be pathogenic. Maybe there's going to be some support in the literature. And it's going to have high relevance to the symptoms, and that would be a success in this context. So for this kind of application, your bioinformatics pipelines have to have very good power to detect wide classes of variation, not only SNPs, but indels, structural variants, and all of those sorts of things. And the pipelines also have to assist with variant interpretation. So most variants, you don't know what they do. So you have to look in databases. You have to come through literature. And you know there are ways to, to do that. Uh, what we're doing is very different, so vastly more directed. So we're doing carrier screening. And what that means is that we specifically test for the presence of specific alleles. Um, although, in some cases, this might be more like uh, the diagnostic odyssey, so you can do 
whole gene cystic fibrosis sequencing, but that's not really typically indicated for most area screening applications. Um, the idea is that we're trying to assess reproductive risk for well-established mutations. So these are diseases that are typically uh, uh, recessive and uh, diseases with fairly high prevalence and diseases where there are mutations that are very well understood to be associated with the disease. And so your bioinformatics pipeline is gonna be a little bit different in this case. The idea is that rather than being able to find every single thing under the sun that might be in your patient, you just have to be very good at detecting very specific things. So as an example, uh, one of the canonical cases for carrier screening is cystic fibrosis. This is a fairly high prevalence condition. It's an autosomal recessive disorder with very well causative mutation. Um, if you have cystic fibrosis, your median survival is about 37. Respiratory failure is the most common cause of death. And the ACOG, which is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommendation is that all women should be offered screening for cystic fibrosis. And this is a table from the ACOG uh, committee opinion. I'm sorry, that says option, it should be opinion. But really one thing to note is that first of all, there's a fairly significant carrier risk before you've had any testing. Detection rate is different in different populations. So there's a very population specific aspect to this. And there's still a residual risk after you've done your carrier screening. And that's because first of all, not all mutations are known. Sometimes there are rare ones. Uh, not all tests are perfect, so sometimes your test result will not reflect your true carrier status. But this is a pretty nice example of why you would do carrier screening. Um, you know, you can sort of reduce the incidence of cystic fibrosis just by giving in people information about their carrier status. So um, I just want to also mention one thing about variants. So um, everybody has a lot of variation with respect to some of them. And in this context, we really care mostly about the health impact of these variants. And the field is moving towards this sort of classification system where a variant might be called pathogenic. And in that case, the variant would be conclusively associated with disease. It might be likely pathogenic, which is to say there might be evidence from the literature that this variant is associated with the disease, but it might not be conclusive. Uh, uncertain significance, this is gonna be most of the variants you find. So there's really not a lot of information either way. There might be in silico tools that tell you one thing, but it's very difficult to trust these tools then variants might be likely benign. So probably not associated with disease, but not a lot of evidence to tell you of that. And then um, variants might be benign, which is to say clearly not associated with disease. And there's one very easy way to know if a variant is benign, and that's if it has very high prevalence in the population. So for example, if your disease occurs at one in 50,000 and your variant is present in 25% of individuals, you know it's almost certainly not associated with that specific disease. So the canonical pathogenic variant is Delta F508. This is in cystic fibrosis. This is a three base pair deletion, and it leads to the loss of a phenylalanine codon, and it disrupts gene function. So if you had two copies of this, you're very, very likely to have cystic fibrosis. Although I do believe that there are cases where we found um, people that are homozygous for this without the disease, but I'm not confident about that. So this is a, an illustration of essentially our screening process. So we get a sample, we do a DNA extraction, and we accept blood, buccal swabs, or mouthwash. We then put the DNA into a fluidine uh, chip, and this is a really nice microfluidics device that lets you do a highly multiplexed PCR. Essentially, you have um, PCR pools over here and, and samples over here, and it will mix each one of these samples with each one of these PCR pools. This is really where bioinformatics enters into the design process, because in order to do an assay in this manifestation, you have to design a whole bunch of PCRs and you have to make them work in a multiplex PCR context, which is, can be a little bit painful. Uh, usually in this situation, like the first 80, 90% of your assays will be fine and getting that last 10 to 20% takes a lot of effort. So after the fluidime, we do a library prep and then we do pooling and then we put it on the sequencer. We're an, an Illumina shop, like I guess most, most clinical sequencing companies. And so we do our carrier screening mostly on a 2500. When the instrument is done, we use cassava to do the multiplex. This is what a cassava looks like if you've never seen one. And if you've ever actually tried to use cassava, you know why I selected this image in particular. And I should say that my hands are not clean. I was once a cassava developer. But um, we use Bowtie 2 for our aligner. And then we use a variant color called Freebase. This is actually a really nice choice for our application because what Freebase will do, or rather we can run it in a mode where it will enumerate alleles that are different from the reference. And one of the real pressing issues in carrier screening is related to incidental findings and variants of unknown significance. So the really nice thing about using Freebase 
is that you can enumerate alleles and then only look for alleles that you're specifically testing. And so you don't actually have to worry about incidental finding because you never will see them. You don't get a V, or we don't run this in a mode where you get a VCF out. We run it in a mode where we can specifically look for, are you a carrier of Delta F508 or S549R or, or one of these pathogenic alleles that we know about. This is actually a little bit of an idealization of, of what the pipeline really looks like um, because you know, between the demultiplexing step and the aligner step, there's actually a fair amount of futzing around you have to do with your reads. So for example, we trim adapters, we also trim primer sequences because in our sequencing experiments, we sequence through the primer. That doesn't really tell you a lot about the underlying genomic sequence. So you got to take that out. Then you align it to uh, using, we use Bowtie 2, it's a pretty nice choice for us. And then, you know, you always have to answer the question of what reference do you use, that can be important. And then if you've ever tried to use tools like Picard or GATK or any of, you know, sort of, a lot of these sort of tools that will look at a band and tell you about things, you know that they can be really fussy about a lot of the um, characteristics of your reads in the bands, your tags and whatnot. So you have to actually do a fair amount of band processing to make your band suitable for these downstream tools. We then use Freebase to enumerate alleles. Uh, we actually run it a couple different times and I'll explain one example of why we would do that. And then we do variant calling based on the Freebase output. And for us, variant calling is very simple. It's just looking at the output of Freebase and asking, is there evidence to support that this patient might carry one of the specific alleles we're looking for? Okay, so now I'm just going to go through a list of some of the problems or challenges that come up when you're developing one of these assays. And when I start with these challenges, I'm going to start with a brief slide about the disease. And the reason that I'm doing this is to just keep in focus that there's a medical context to this work. So a lot of the problems are very specific. A lot of the solutions are very practical and ad hoc. And so really I want to be clear that the reason that we do this is so that we can address a medical need. Because if you have some high prevalence diseases in a population, you really don't have a good test unless you can conclusively identify carrier status for them. So Gaucher's disease um, is a disease in which fatty substances accumulate in cells and organs. And it's autosomal recessive. It's caused by a defect in the GBA gene. And one of the higher prevalence mutations that causes Gaucher's, type 1 Gaucher's, is a 55 pair deletion in, um, in the gene. And this disease has variable severity and onset. So the reason I'm telling you about this is because it's, it's really challenging. And the reason that it's challenging is that there's a pseudogene just downstream of the GBA gene. And that pseudogene actually carries the 55 pace pair deletion. And so if you have a subject with a deletion and you have your PCR amplicon that correctly identifies the genetic lesion in the gene, it actually will map by your mapper to the pseudogene because the pseudogene looks a lot like the gene. And so um, this caused us quite a lot of sorrow and angst because this pseudogene is so similar to GBA with the pathogenic variant. And so here's an example. This is a um, screenshot from a tool called IGV, and it's a way of looking at, at read stacks. Um, this is a compressed view, so each block represents a different amplicon. So um, in the course of developing a carrier screening panel, you typically try a lot of different amplicons for some of these more challenging um, assays. And the thing to notice is that you know, you're seeing really homogeneous looking blocks. And this is in a sample that actually carries the, the GD Del 55 variant. And really what you would hope to see is that there's some indication that a lot of these reads are, are, are a little bit disrupted. And so you might ask, where did those reads go? Because you know they amplify just fine. Well, it turns out they align to the pseudogene. And uh, this is one of the things that indicates that um, something funny is going on. So here's the pseudogene. These blue lines indicate a difference from the reference. And what this means is that the amplicon is actually amplifying the reference deletion, but mapping to the pseudogene. And, um, you know, this is just sort of like a little challenge that you have to solve in order to correctly characterize this variant. So I'll describe what we did to solve this problem. So we looked at the sequence of the pseudogene and we found one base pair difference, actually, between the pseudogene sequence and the actual GD55 gene. And so, you know, basically the idea is just look at the reads for that single base difference and then check for the reference and deletion. But the way that we do it, is a little bit um, unusual. What we're going to do is make a custom chromosome that actually has the sequence of the event we're looking for. One of the other difficulties is that in a multiplex PCR 
situation, some of your amplicons will behave very well and some will behave very problematically. Here's an example of a sample from a, a, a patient that has the 55 base base pair deletion, and here's one that does not. This is actually mapping to the pseudogene. And what you'd really like is that there's some systematic difference in one of these colored blocks. These all represent different amplicons. And it turns out that one of the amplicons, just for whatever reason, ended up working very well. So when you have the 55 base pair deletion, it looks clearly different than when you don't. This amplicon is awesome for this purpose. So the approach, what we ended up doing, was building a custom chromosome for the reads to map to. So you know, we have the situation where in the healthy state they map one way, and in the pathogenic state they map in another way. So we just give them a place to land in some sense. We filter the BAM at the end. So we leave a, a file that only has reads from the one amplicon that happened to work. And then we focus on this hero nucleotide. So what we have observed is that when the variants exists when you have the deletion on this custom chromosome, about 50% of the coverage is going to be from the real gene and about 50% is going to be from the pseudogene. That's going to look like a heterozygous mix. And when the variant is missing, then everything comes from the pseudogene and that's going to look like a home. So this is what it looks like when you look at the IGV. This is the custom chromosome that we just made up. Here are two samples with the variant and you can clearly see this sort of heterozygous looking thing here. And here without the variant, this is from the pseudogene. And so this is just an example of some of the very practical dirty bioinformatics that you have to do to make a variant work. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears and tell you about one more of these sort of practical things. Um, this is going to be a story about our informed PGX product. So the idea is that there are genes obviously involved in drug metabolism. And for some important psychiatric medication, there are known variants that make some individuals metabolize these drugs much more quickly or much more slowly than most people. And this is actually really important if a psychiatrist is trying to adjust your dosage of a medication. So the difficulty is that in the relevant genes, we actually have to determine the haplotypes rather than isolated variants. So it's not so much that you have one variant in this gene, it's that you have a few and they're you know, too far away to be put in the same short read. And you have to figure out what is the haplotype status of this subject. And you have to do it from isolated individual variant cells. And in general, you can't, but in this case, you can. So here's the source of our variants. We use this um, list of what are called star alleles, and a star allele is just a set of variants in one of these drug metabolizing genes. So this is CYP2D6, and here's an example. CYP2D6 star 1A means that you carry this particular deletion, or I'm sorry, yeah, I think that's what it is. Um, one thing to notice is in our product, we really focused on the star alleles that were relevant for making drug dosage decisions. And we're really focusing on the major variants for each star allele. So you'll notice that some of these are in bold, some are just um, linked to, and then some are, are, are dark. These ones in bold are the ones that I think really define the mutation. So those are the ones you have to focus on. But you also have to account for all the other stuff. So what we do is, um, you know, we do our normal data analysis workflow. We do the variant calling. Then we get the list of variants and SNPs. And then the task is to figure out what star alleles are consistent with the SNPs that we've observed in the subject. And then we have to figure out what is the metabolizer status. And we do this based on literature and a lookup table. So really the challenge is just figuring out what is the star allele status based on these genotypes. So for example, you might have a subject that carries these, these alleles in 2D6. That might be consistent with these star alleles. And depending on which star allele combination you land on, you might be an ultra-rapid metabolizer, an extensive metabolizer, intermediate, or a poor metabolizer. And one of the interesting things is that there's really a tremendous amount of structure in these. Yeah, please do. No, that's a really good question. We, um, hired someone who knows about this stuff to, to know about the literature. So like, this is never us coming up with this knowledge. We, we go to people who know what they're doing, take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's an example of a star allele, CYP2D6. It's got these two variants. So CYP2D6 star 2 is right here. But you'll notice that CYP2D6 star 41 actually has a substantial amount of overlap. It actually has these two variants, but this is actually the, the major variant. And so you know, there's sort of like, um, some sort of nesting or, or subset relationship. 2D6 star 10 here 
carries one of them but has a different one. And so actually ascertaining the haplotype can be a little bit tricky. But it turns out that there's a, a fairly simple solution. So um, what I've done is just made a table with all the star alleles for 2D6. And the green variants are major and the orange are not major. And so what you can do is um, just enumerate all the possibilities. So for example, when you have these, uh, for a, a subject, you'd have these um, allele statuses. And you'd notice that they were consistent with these star alleles. What we do in practice, though, is actually just generate all the combinations of all the alleles we look for. And again, just keep in mind, very simple, practical, applied solutions. These are not elegant methodologies. But you know, so if you have, if you're uh, star 10A, star 10A, then you would be homozygous for 4180G to C. And you would be homozygous for 100C to C. Whereas if you were star 11, star 14A, you'd be home for these two and hep for these three. And um, in practice, this actually works surprisingly well. Uh, most of the subjects that we've looked at fall neatly into one of these categories. They're actually consistent with only one star allele status and um, not any of the others. So here's an example. Um, on the top, I put the patient genotype. Uh, red is homozygous and blue is het. And on the rows, I'm showing you which statuses are consistent with this combination of genotypes. And it turns out that in this example, uh, there's only one combination that's consistent, and that's star 4A, star 41. But of course, this doesn't work all the time. So um, I'm just going to skip ahead. So here's an example where you're home for this, home for this, and het for this. And if you look down this table, uh, you'll find that there's really no star allele combination that's consistent with these observed genotypes. So it could be that this subject has a different star allele that we're not looking for. It could be, you know, there, there are a number of, of possibilities. But um, in any case, this method works really well. It works most of the time, but certainly not all the time. OK, and this is going to be my last anecdote from the world of carrier screening. This is related to a disease called homocystinuria. And uh, this is most commonly caused by mutations in the CBS gene. And you get a severe buildup of homocysteine in the thionine. Uh, mutations have variable penetrance. And this can cause developmental delay or intellectual disability, myopia, and skeletal abnormalities. And this is a, this is a new case. And in many ways, this is, I think, my favorite of, of the three anecdotes I'm going to describe. So we had an assay that looked for the variant. We're looking for the SNPs, but we made a very odd observation immediately, which is to say that we had 59 positives out of 768 samples in, in a test set. And that's 7%. That's vastly too high for the prevalence of the disease. And then we got sort of odd allele ratios. So we'd either get something that was consistently there but less than 15% or greater than 40%. But the weirdest thing about this is that in our amplicon, we actually had two reads that overlapped, and they both covered the variant. But we only saw the variant allele in R1 in these cases, even though both read 1 and read 2 cover the SNP. That was very weird. We've never seen that before. Here's an example. So here, I'm showing the two reads overlapping. This is one amplicon. And this is, this is the variant right here. This is the one that um, is pathogenic for, uh, for the disease. And you can see here in read 1, a lot of these reads are carrying it. They're also carrying these other variants that are sort of suspicious. And this is read 2, and it looks totally different. But these should be from the same molecule. So um, what do you do in this case? Well, it turns out one of the most effective things you can do is go search the literature and see if people have seen sort of similar things or odd things about this particular variant. And the story here is sort of pleasing. It turns out that in a fairly substantial fraction of a population, there's actually an insertion that looks just like what we're testing for. And so um, you know, we had one probe over here, and we had one probe over here in the normal. I'm sorry, in, in the normal. So this is the wild type. Probe over here, probe over here. You know, read one, read two, they overlap. But when there's this novel insertion, then read one actually reads into the insertion, which actually carries something that looks just like the allele. And so um, it still boggles me that this is as common as it is if this is really the explanation. Because it seems like this should have a pretty big impact on a medically relevant gene. Yet nevertheless, this actually does seem to be in the population. 
So what we're doing is, uh, first of all, confirming that this is the right explanation because this is a little bit exotic. So we're actually just sequencing some of these things on a MySeq with longer reads, where we can actually get through that novel insertion if it actually is there. And then the bioinformatics solution is you just trim read one. So if you don't trust read one and you do trust read two, just trim read one down and you're analyzing your data and, and then the problem will go away. Again, very ad hoc, very unsatisfying, but really effective. So the conclusions from my carrier screening uh, section or vignette is that it's a little bit different than a lot of other clinical sequencing. So really the issue here is that must have variants are really must have. You have to have them in order to have a good test. There is no cystic fibrosis carrier screen unless you can get delta F508. In this world, we actually really emphasize established methodologies along with documentation, formal validation, and quality management. So, you know, this is really more like professional software development than a lot of other bioinformatics stuff. It's sort of, you know, I guess very conservative. And, and you really like to be using a method other people have been working on for a long time, if, if at all you can. Um, a lot of, yeah, you actually have a lot of problems that you have to solve in order to make the pipeline work for all the variants you're targeting. Uh, but the solutions can be ad hoc. That's perfectly fine. You just have to have something that works. As long as it's straightforward, you're, you're pretty happy. And the solutions that you, you adopt will be driven by your assay technology. So because you know that you have the two reads and one is causing trouble, you just get rid of the one that's causing trouble and you're done. And in terms of the bioinformatics efforts that you do when you're developing carrier screens, I mean, probe design is huge. Uh, you have to do a lot of it. Uh, data analysis tends to be the difficult part because the question is not how do you fix a problem, the question is what is actually the problem. And so with this read one, read two issue, you never really would have understood what was going on unless you found that paper, got a hypothesis and you know, could maybe address it. And uh, you know, we're developing a lot of pipelines all the time and we're, uh, it always takes a lot of effort to run research grade software. I mean, most of the stuff in next-gen sequencing is written by grad students or postdocs. Yeah, this is not a criticism. I, I was a grad student. I wrote some travel software myself. But um, if someone wants to take it and put it into a clinical pipeline, you have to really do a lot of testing and quality assurance to make sure that it's going to work uh, and be fit for purpose. And then we do a lot of process control, which can be challenging uh, with Illumina technology. And you know, I worked at Illumina. But you have to do a lot to make sure that your runs today look a lot like they looked six months ago because you want a very stable, high-performing solid assay. And you want to know that the conditions that you established when you validated it are continue to be the conditions when you're actually running it. Okay, so that was carrier screening. Now I'm going to take, oh, yeah, please. We didn't because we're doing this all in fluidine. So this is all multiplex PCR and we're not like running it out on gel. We could have done that, but. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can also just sequence the library on a MySeq with like a two by 300. Um, but yeah, you could also just run it on a gel, make sure it was longer and that would be just as informative. Yeah, yeah, no, please. Yeah, yeah. The amplicon is amplifying both because um, the pseudogene looks so much like the one, the other one with the 55. And you know, one of the things that makes this a little more complicated is that these are multiplex PCRs. So if you have an amplicon that's normally one length in the multiplex, and then it gets to a different length, it'll actually often behave really differently. So there's some funny interactions. That can... Yeah, Well, we, t we, I mean, we look for it when we can, especially for some of the mo more difficult genes. Like CYP2D6 is just a nightmare to design primers for. And that's one of the ones that we actually really struggle to, to get. Um, in practice, what we really focus on is can we validate our assay in samples that are known to carry the variants? And so, you know, if you hit that target, you're done. And if you don't hit that target, you have to do whatever you can to get there. So there's always going to be a little bit of noise. Um, we haven't looked for it. Uh, certainly, it, it's, it's an absolutely a concern. Um, in, 
when you have a product like this, though, essentially what you have to do is define its performance characteristics, and as long as you hit those, then you're happy. And you have to sort of be careful with looking into things too deeply because then you run into the possibility of incidental findings or finding out things that you don't want to know. So we don't necessarily do a lot of investigation of that sort of thing, but it, it is a very real possibility that could cause hijinks in some subjects. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to leave all notions of actually helping people behind. And I'm going to talk about a very abstract algorithm that I've been working on for a while. Okay, so here's the problem that my algorithm solves. Find all approximate occurrences of each needle in the haystack. So this is an all versus all comparison problem. So these are like going to be 20 mers. These are like what I'm calling needles. You're looking for needles in a haystack. This is the haystack. So you want to find all pairs where one sequence is from the needle set and one is from the haystack set, and they have at most one mismatch with respect to one another. So this conceptually is a lot like read mapping, and I'll show you some benchmarking results that sort of compares this to read mapping, uh, where the needles are reads and the haystack is the genome. But you know, keep in mind that everything is fixed length here. And um, you know, I want to telegraph that I'm still looking for things to appropriately benchmark this against. So if anyone has any ideas, I'd be very interested to hear them. But I call this algorithm Linnaeus because it's you know, very heavily oriented towards trees. And it efficiently finds all pairs of these, these 20 mers, one from a needle set and one from a haystack set with up to one mismatch. And the way that it works is it builds this index on the needles and it builds another index on the haystack. These indexes are very fast and efficient to build. And then it uses these indexes to guide what subsets of these mers you actually have to compare to one another in order to solve this problem. So there's a standard data structure, very old timey, very, very classic stuff called a tri. And this is like a, a tree where each node is associated with a sequence. And um, you know, essentially the, 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 the deal here is that the, the nodes are ordered. So they're, they're ordered the same in, at each branch. And so if you know the sequence, you can very efficiently compute which leaf it would be associated to. And um, for our purposes, we're only going to focus on the leaves. We're not going to deal with anything related to these internal nodes. So um, you know, it's very, very straightforward to compute given a sequence which leaf it falls into. So let S sub i be the base at position i, and let p be the lexicographic position of S sub i. And let's say that this is just the number of elements. So this very simple sum, which oh, looks awful here. Um, well, suffice it to say that all you have, it's like computing a, an integer expansion or something. but uh, you know, given the lexicographic position of each base, uh, you can quickly just compute a number, and that's the index of the leaf to which this base would be associated. Now, what I'm going to do is actually switch things out a little bit. I'm going to use a very carefully chosen alphabet to construct my try. So I'm not going to use DNA sequences. I'm going to use something a little bit different. And what I'm going to use is something called a perfect Hamming code, and it's a perfect Hamming code on DNA 5 MERS. So this came from a really nice paper that appeared a few years ago in BMC Genomics. And these authors were sort of you know, working on short read mappers, like a lot of people are working on. And they want to sort of find faster ways to find seeds. And so what they've done is they've presented 64 5 MERS. And there are 1,024 5 MERS altogether. And they have some really surprising properties. So every 5 MER is either one of these code words, or it's within Hamming distance 1 of exactly one of the code words. So they sort of partition the space of 5 MERS in a really nice way. Each code word has Hamming distance of 1 to exactly 5 5 mers. And I should say that Hamming distance is just the number of mismatches when you line sequences up uh, position by position. So there's no notion of insertion or deletion. It's just, it's just mismatches. And these code words are what I'm going to use for the alphabet uh, for the Linnaeus trial. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff in this paper. And one of the things that I, I always kind of liked about it was that um, it turns out that 3 times the length of your k-mer plus 1 has to be a power of 4 in order for this to work. And so that works for length 5. And 21 and up, but there's not a lot in between. So you're sort of restricted in the k-mers for which you can derive one of these perfect Hamming codes. Here's a visualization. This is just done with graphs, but you know, essentially it looks kind of like a lot of flowers, and this is just sort of a way to sort of visualize what this is doing. In the middle is the perfect Hamming code code word, and radiating out are all of the five mers that are associated with this perfect Hamming code. And if you stared at this image and blew it up, you would notice that this sequence, for example, GAGTT, is one mismatch away from this sequence, which is the code word GCGTT, and it's at least three mismatches away from every single other code word. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these code words to build up equivalence classes on longer lengths of sequences, and I'm just going to do that by concatenating them. So here is a template sequence, uh, for one perfect counting code word, and here's another, so gtag and cgaac. Here are the five MERS that they cover or that are associated with them. And so um, think about what happens when you concatenate these two code words. Uh, each one of these, so this 10 MERS is going to be uniquely close to 256 10 MERS because the first five bases is going to be uniquely close to one of the five MERS, and the second five bases is going to have the similar property. So you can build up equivalence classes using this perfect Hamming code on longer sequences as long as you're just concatenating these code words together. And a really critical property, what's really interesting about this, is that the 10 MERS are going to have a bounded error rate with respect to the template. And with that, because you know that there's only one mismatch in the first five bases and one in the second five bases, all of the 10 MERS that are associated with this concatenated pair of code words are going to look a lot like this 10 MERS sequence. So this is what the try looks like if you build it on the perfect Hamming code alphabet. So you have five MERS. The branching factor is 64 because there's 64 code words. Uh, we're only representing the leaves. And if you want to represent 20 MERS, you have to go out uh, four deep. And that means you have about 16 million leaves. So it turns out that it's incredibly fast to compute which leaf is associated with an arbitrary 20 MERS. All you have to do is you have a lookup table on five MERS and it says, here's a five MER, what's my perfect Hamming code? And you just need to do a couple multiplications and additions and then you get the index of the leaf that you would put that 20 MER into. And that's one of the reasons that this approach is fast. It's very, very fast to build this tri structure. So what you need to do is you have to just allocate 16 million lists roughly. Then for every 20 MER in the input sequence, you just compute the leaf index and you insert it into that list for the appropriate leaf. Now, this is fast for two reasons. First of all, it's fast because finding the leaf is fast. It's just some lookups and some multiplications and additions. And there's no sorting. We don't care about the order within the leaf. You just have to put it into a list. So there, you, you don't have that n log n step. So the algorithm I'm just about to describe is an all versus all search algorithm. And it's going to take advantage of a lot of the properties of this tree that come from the fact that I have the specially chosen alphabet. And what I'm going to do is build an index on the needles and another on the haystack. So let's think about the naive version of this problem. So if you're going to you know, go through the trouble of making one of these trees and you want to find all pairs of needles, that, all pairs of uh, k-mers from one from here and one from here that are similar, you know, one thing, the naive algorithm, is that you just iterate for every loop, every leaf here, then you'd have to compare it to every leaf over here. And then for all the sequences in this leaf, you have to compare it to all the sequences in all of these leaves. So for each leaf in the needle, for each leaf in the haystack, then for each camer in the needle leaf, and for each camer in the haystack leaf, you check them, and then you'd report if they have very close handling distance. And uh, you know, this would certainly take a long time, and we can do a lot better. But you know, you, because there's 16 million things here and 16 million things here, you have about 10 to the 14th pairs of leaves to compare, and a lot of the um, camers with inside them. So, so this, is, this is awful so far. But you can actually use that bounded error rate property to improve things quite a bit. So remember that each 5 MER segment of a 20 MER has at most one mismatch to the template sequence of the leaf. So consider a KMER X in leaf A and a KMER Y in leaf B. So if the perfect Hamming code code words are different, you know that there has to be at least one mismatch in this segment. So um, you don't, what this means is that if you're only interested in this Hamming distance one comparison, you don't ever need to look at leaves with at more than at least two different code words. So you essentially, if you're looking for all of the friends of the KMERS in this leaf, you have, to you have to look in all of the leaves that would be computed by taking the same three in one position and just swapping out the other code words for this one, because those are all of the places where the friends might live with one mismatch. And you have to do it for the second and the third and the fourth. So this is actually a huge improvement already. So to find the mismatches, Again, all you have to do is look at four blocks of 63 code words. And so that means that you actually, for each leaf, you only have to look at 253 leaves for Hamming distance one mismatches uh, to the sequences in that leaf. But you can actually get better by thinking geometrically. So this is a metric space. And so what that means is that you just have a set and a, and a distance metric, and you can compute distances between all of the elements in the set. So each 
code word actually defines what's called a closed ball in this metric space. The code word is the center, and all of the five mers with Hamming distance one form the points in this closed ball. So in the next few slides, I'm going to be drawing circles. Uh, don't take that too literally, but I, I do mean like in, in this topological sense that we're, we're working with closed balls of radius one defined by the code, code word. So there's, there's an intuition here that we're going to leverage. Suppose that we have two closed balls in some metric space. The question is, can you say anything about the difference, the, the distances in the points of one ball as compared to the other, if you know something about the distances between the center? And the answer is absolutely yes, your intuition is right. If the centers are far apart from one another, then the points within the balls must also be far apart from one another. So we're going to use the triangle inequality in a very simple way. So um, the triangle inequality just says that for three points, a, B, and C, that the distance between A and C has to be less than or equal to the distance between A and B and, and B and C. And so we're going to use a triangle inequality to exploit this geometrical property that if the centers of two closed balls are far apart, then the points within them must also be far apart. And if you know about metric spaces and you know about the triangle inequality, you know that there are some very subtle and devious applications. There are some tricky things you can do. Don't worry, we're not going to do that. I'm actually, in the next slide, going to have numbers, like real numbers, concrete numbers. That's how simple this is. So um, one thing to notice about the code words is that they have to be far apart. So you can't have code words that have distance of one or two, otherwise you wouldn't have this sort of unambiguous assignment property. So the code words have to have at least distance three. And you can show that because the distance between the centers has to be less than or equal to the distance between the center and this point, and then the distance between this point, with some very, very simple algebra, you can show that if the Hamming words, if the code words have um, distance three, then the closest that their sequences could be is distance one. So you'd have to check those. But if the words have distances four or five, then the closest their sequences could be is having distance two or three. And you don't have to check those for these uh, off by one mismatch. So we've actually got another improvement. So the naive approach is all versus all. You could do better by just noting that you have this bounded error rate so that you'd only have to look at a couple hundred. But um, it turns out that if you use the triangle inequality, then you only have to look at 30 other code words. Now, I'm sure that there's some really sophisticated way to compute mathematically that a perfect Hamming code five-mer is Hamming distance three away from 30 others. I don't know how to do that, but I can write a for loop, and I can. It's just a very easy thing to check, and it turns out that 30 is the number. And so if you are a camera in a leaf, what this all boils down to is that you only have to check 121 leaves in the other data structure out of 16 million to find these distance one mismatches to the, to the camera sequences you're looking for. So um, this is pretty close to the end of my talk. I'm just going to present a couple benchmarking results. Uh, so just a few implementation details. I encode 20 mers as 64-bit ints, and I'm going to do a lot of stuff with bit arithmetic. Uh, the Hamming distance between encoded ints is actually very close to something called a pop count of A, X, or B under this encoding. Uh, pop count is a chip level instruction, so it can be very, very fast. I use two bit encoding, so there are cases where you could have Hamming distance one but a pop count of two. So you have to do a little bit more work just to make sure that you're not in one of those cases. But, um, you know, it turns out that there are some pretty quick ways to do that also using bit arithmetic. Uh, and if, if you're into bit arithmetic, I highly recommend this book called Hacker's Delight because it's just like a laundry list of, of crazy cool tricks you can do with, with bit encoding. Uh, this is all implemented in C++. And uh, because this was actually work that I did when I was at Illumina, it took me a while to get them to agree to let me to release it. So um, I'm going to release it pretty quickly under an Illumina open source license on GitHub. I'm still sort of working through the last details of that. So if anyone is interested or wants to check it out, let me know and I can give you access. But it'll be open pretty soon. So um, one of the difficulties is understanding what programs I can use to compare to this, because I don't really know of other programs that solve this specific problem. So, you know, putting on my bioinformatician hat, one thing that's, you know, pretty obvious is that you can use a short read mapper to solve this problem. And this is actually fairly similar to the sort of thing that Bowtie 1 was actually designed to address back when reads were very, very short. So Bowtie 1 is maybe not such a stretch for this particular thing. But what you'd do is you'd build an index on the haystack and you'd run the mapper on the needle. And you'd run the mapper in such a way that it would get all of the 20 mers with timing distance at most, most one. So bowtie one is actually very good about setting these sorts of things. You can do it with bowtie two, but it's a little bit harder. 
And then there's another uh, mapper called Razor S3 that I used to compare uh, at the suggestion of some of my collaborators. And um, you know, this one is nice because there's no indexing step, it's just sort of a scanning method. And this is work in progress. I'm still working with some of my, my friends to sort of figure out you know, what are tools that are actually closer to this problem so I can get a nicer benchmark. But you know, in order to benchmark this, I just generated some, some k-mers and I made sure that, that there was varying levels of overlap because one of my concerns was that you know, it could be that there's some performance penalty if there are a lot of things that match as opposed to very few. So here at 10% overlap, which means that 10% of the sequences agree, um, are wall clock times for the various methods. Um, so I looked at 10,000 needles, 500,000 needles, and 10 million needles, and then 100,000 haystacks, a million, and 10 million. And you know what you can see is that if you don't have that many needles or that many haystacks, then um, these other tools do really well. But actually, as you scale up, as you have more and more comparisons, uh, Linnaeus actually starts doing better and better. And you know I like to think that this is because of the intrinsic efficiency of the algorithm for this particular thing. But it could also just be because the uh, aligner developers haven't spent a lot of time making the index building step fast. Because in order to use the aligners, you have to build the index. And you know, in most applications, you only do that once. So who cares if it takes a little bit longer than it needs to, whereas they really spend a lot of time making sure the mapping step is really, really fast. This is not a completely fair comparison. But I think you can draw some idea about scaling behavior. And the numbers look very, very similar if there's a high degree of overlap. So if there's lots and lots of matches between the, the set. OK, so this is uh, the end of my talk. Um, these are my conclusions on the very abstract and not helping people part. So this try data structure, I think, is really interesting. It leads to this really efficient all versus all comparison method. But it has some funny restrictions. Uh, all the cameras have to be the same length, and that length has to be a multiple of five. So I think that this idea of partitioning these cameras into equal and disjoint equivalence classes has some really nice properties. There's some other applications that I'm still sort of working through. But um, you know, what's sort of nice about this data structure is that you derive these templates that are associated with a lot of sequence, and the templates look very, very similar to all of the sequences. And then another thing that's nice is there's really no sorting. This is an all versus all method intrinsically. You don't really care about the order of the needles in each of the, of the leaves. And that's one of the reasons, it's just an insertion. It's really quick. Uh, one thing I should point out is that I'm still working on the multi threaded implementation. So when I run all of these, the benchmarks I showed were in single threaded mode. Uh, when I actually do multi threaded mode, then Linnaeus is no longer as fast. And I think that, or at least my explanation at the moment, is that these aligner authors you know, spend a lot of time making sure the multi threading is very good. I've spent much less time making sure the multi threading is very good. So I think that the single threaded mode is a fair comparison, but still, if you're actually trying to solve the problem, uh, you know, the, the aligners are still very good tools if you have you know, a big old buff computer with lots of cores. And you know, just as a programming nerd, I think that there's a lot that I can do to improve the cache locality of the innermost loop, and I'm sort of looking into that. But um, you know, not, not all that intensively, because this is more of just like a side project. So um, I don't know if the code is going to change all that much, but I'm going to put it out there. And if, if people like it, hopefully they can do some stuff with it as well. So uh, I'd like to finish with some acknowledgments. So the Linnaeus work, um, I did at Illumina. And so people that were helpful there were Simeon Kubliak and Brent Sickler. And then at Progenity, on the carrier screening stuff, I've worked very closely with some very good scientists, uh, Jeff Lewis, Shanda Joe, and Amanda Vasquez. And a lot of the bioinformatics work in the carrier screening stuff, a lot of these innovative solutions were uh, done by Hung Wong, who actually came here and he was just fantastic. And Julie Kim also did a lot of the probe design. And she was also actually here as well. So that's my talk. Thank you. And, uh, Happy to take questions. Boy, that's a good question. Um, Typically, the number of barcodes that you have is fairly modest in comparison to the regimes where this algorithm works well. So if you have 10,000 barcodes, it's not so hard to, to match them up. If you had 100 million barcodes in a highly error-prone sequencer, then this might be more of a realistic application. I guess I'm just sort of maybe this is completely off base, but I'm wondering like 
to this Linnaeus, how, how that would work in sort of a cooled microbiome type sample where you're trying to, to piece out the number of OTUs and you have these counts and uh, these individual chambers that you could use. I mean, it seems like that might be an interesting application for that. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, one of the things about this algorithm is, you know, I essentially had an idea for a data structure and no biological applications whatsoever. So metagenomics seems like it might be a natural fit if you sort of want to take a sequence and ask, what are the similarities between this and another? I mean, you could probably also do it again with the short read mapping. But, um, you know, this might work really fairly well if there were some cryptic sequences that you really didn't know to look for. Yeah. SIP2D6 and the other pharmacogenomic analyses. I didn't realize these were required a whole haplotype to be recognized. How do you, what do you know about the sequences across species? Do we know anything about the evolution to these haplotypes or the selective factors? Where would we start? I mean, how much data is there on these loci across the distant species? I have no idea. It's a really good question. I think that a lot of these haplotypes are just discovered by sequencing different populations. So I think that a lot of them are probably fairly specific to human populations in Indonesia. Uh, that said, there might be certain functional variants that are similar, but I'm honestly not sure. So if you look at these very loci in different human populations, are the haplotypes you know, lineage specific or do you find them in different ethnic populations? geographic populations? I'm honestly not sure. Because that we'd probably need to know for diagnostic purposes. Yeah, I mean, we're really using it to help guide psychiatrists with dosing. And so we sort of very, we focus very closely on the functional aspect. But there is a really interesting population aspect as well. So, so towards the end of the first part of your talk, you mentioned that you have to maintain stability in light of all of the variations that Illumina likes to throw at you. And a lot of times they change chemistry and all these other variables. And that induces artifacts and variant calling. At least we noticed it er in the earlier uh, chemistry transitions. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about how you kind of assess those systematic variations in the technology and what you do to mitigate the effects of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of our advantages is that we are asking very specific questions of the genome. And so, for example, if you go from a PCR library prep to a PCR-free library prep, all of a sudden you have better coverage in GC region. And your power to detect variants there is much improved. We're doing targeted sequencing, though. And so typically, um, the effect on our amplification and, I guess, sequencing capacity is, is much more modest there. So in practice, when we get a new lot of reagents or we consider switching to a different chemistry, or even when we get a new sequencer and qualify it, we do some validation experiments on a set of samples with known variants, and we make sure that we can identify those variants. And if we correctly identify the variants, it's okay if there actually are some small process drift issues, because really what we focus on is, that, is you know, the power to detect those variants. Uh, the things that we're sort of looking for, though, are um, drifts in the proportion of samples with specific alleles. So, you know, you want your allele frequency to be really stable over time because the assumption is the population is not changing all that much. So we look at that. Um, we also look sort of at cluster density, for example, and you want to make sure that just the protocols are fairly stable with respect to cluster density. But if you get a new kit, you certainly might see a, a jump. You know, and you know, you get a new enzyme, so you never know if the enzyme is going to have the same activity or concentration. So again, you know, you get a new lot of that. You just run a validation and make sure that things are behaving as expected. You also do analyses for uh, RB2, HER2, nu, you know, the breast cancer subtype, which is highly overexpressed in a certain category of breast cancers? No, we do carrier screening for um, assessment of reproductive health risk. And so we really try to limit ourselves to high prevalence conditions with very well understood variants that are, you know, essentially autosomal recessive diseases. So we're very um, focused in terms of what we're testing for. 
The reason I asked is a very interesting problem. Uh, these are natural am amplicons. You're talking about PCR amplicons, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So around that particular gene, R2 nu or B2, chromosome 17, Q12, there are about 23 genes with RB2 in the center. And patients who have overexpression have amplification in that region, sometimes just overregulation, overexpression by cis regulation. And they can have one or several or many of those adjacent genes also overexpressed. I don't know if this comes up in any other assays that you're working on, but it seems to me that this is a diagnostic uh, clue that there might be gold in, in that uh, variability to explain why some patients with the overexpression of a particular gene have more extreme or less extreme phenotype or more uh, predictable or less predictable response to a specific targeted therapy. Somebody's done that, but it seems logical. No, I'm also interested in splice variants. When you find splice isoforms of this gene and other genes, do you ever turn that up in your amplification of these um, markers? Uh, no, but we mostly focus on DNA. This is purely DNA Strictly stuff. DNA. Yeah, it's strictly DNA. And gotcha. not only that, but we're very focused in terms of what we look for because there's always a risk of incidental findings. And so if you look broadly outside of the specific variants you're looking for, you might find something with a health impact that you didn't have to report to a patient. So we focus very carefully on only looking for the specific variants that are on our test menu, just in DNA. And you know, really the reason is just to avoid any issues regarding incidental findings. All right, well, thanks Tobias. Thank you.